If you're ready to experience more peace and joy in your life, if you want to feel more comfortable in your own skin, and if you're ready to discover and expand on your energetic gifts and personal power, you're in the right place. So here's your host, Kelly Sparta. Welcome back to Spirit Guides. This is our Mystical Mondays, and I am your host, Kelly Sparta, Transformational Shaman. I am here, as always, with my co-host, Joshua Radwan, and we are talking today about the giving tree and other narcissistic tales, except that we're not going to talk about that yet, because in our conversation before we got on this call, Josh said something to me, and I was like, I need to give you some coaching on that because we, and can we do it on air? And he has graciously said yes to that, by the way. Very so. graciously. <laughs> I'm, I'm semi-resistant to it, so let's do it because that's how it works. <laughs> So say to me again, so we were talking about Napoleon Hill and Josh has just finished reading Outwitting the Devil. And so say to me again what you said about Napoleon. So uh, I, Napoleon Hill wrote a, a fantastic book called Outwitting the Devil. And for me, it was one of the greatest tools in overcoming a lot of the fear that I had brought into this life and through experiences in this life. But I began to have questions as as to him when I started, you know, he he really kind of it had a lot to say about some of the elite of the time, you know, your your Henry Fords, your Rockefellers, the Carnegie. And, you know, like I have always had qualms with, with what I perceive to be the elite and, you know, what, what I have perceived them to do to the world. And you are now going to get to hear me get coached live from Kelly, so I can't wait to hear this next piece. <laughs> <laughs> so... All right, so the first thing that you have to understand is that your knee-jerk reaction is actually part of cultural programming. <coughs> and so there is a whole level of cultural programming that says, eat the rich, the rich are evil, right? And the challenge with this cultural programming is that when you, as a spiritual practitioner, are trying to get your work out into the world, it makes you afraid to make too much money it, because you are associating yourself with that, you know, people are evil, rich people are evil, right? That, that context. Now, why would they program us to believe that the rich are evil? Well, because it does this, right? Because it sets it up, right? And the more you believe that that's true, the more poor you will remain. And so, you know, Money is like anything else. And money is just like a hammer. You can use it to build a house or you can use it to kill somebody. It is the same thing. It just It's an amplifier. It makes you more of who you already are. It is a tool that helps you to do what you want to do. And if you associate people with money with evil, then you will never have money. Right? And that's the challenge because we buy into this cultural programming because it's everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere you look, especially on social media, especially if you're on TikTok. TikTok has got an entire eat the rich section. You know, it's all good. But, you know, but you have to understand that when you buy into that, that's you're you're buying into staying poor. Because I want everybody who is spiritually awake and spiritually aware to have fuck tons of money. That's what I want. Because money is the currency, and I mean that in terms of electrical current, right? <laughs> money is the currency of, of the U.S. and pretty much every country, right? And when you have more of the currency, you have more of the power. And I want more of the power in the hands of the people who are spiritually awake and aware and who want to build a better world for everybody rather than the people who are in their selfish space, right? And, you know, are there selfish millionaires and billionaires? Absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt. Are there good people? Yes. There are good people who have millions and billions of dollars. I mean, it's just, just statistically speaking, it must be true, right? And all you have to do to prove this to yourself is go out and research philanthropists, right? Because philanthropists are giving away lots of money, doing lots of good in the world, whatever, whatever. And that can give you some perspective on that. There are, the, the biggest problem right now is that the... The people who have lots of money who want you to know about it 
are the narcissists, right? <laughs> they're, they're out there being like, look at me, look at me. And we're talking about narcissistic tales today, right? You know, they're, they're the ones who are promoting the fact that they have lots of money and all the things, right? And then, you know, there are these quiet people who have lots of money who are doing good in the world, but they're quiet about it because they don't need to be seen, right? And so, you know, there's, I've done a lot of research into affluence and the issues around affluence. And one of the challenges is finding purpose. And one of the other challenges is feeling like, you know, you're imbalanced with the world around you. And that, that, you know, that you've got what other people don't and what do you do about that and how do you deal with it and all of that. So, you know, to say that they don't care is, is wrong. It's just a matter of, you know, at some point they have to figure out how to deal, right? And they're just people trying to get through life like everybody else, right? So we just need to stop demonizing one specific space, right? We need to just stop demonizing that money equals evil because it doesn't. And even the quote in the Bible that is so poorly quoted every time, it says that, you know, the, the, the love of money is the root of all evil, right? Well, except that it's, you know, you know, usually it's said that money is the root of all evil, but it's the love of money that's the root of all evil, right? It's that desire to have money over other things. And then the idea that the rich man can't get through the eye of the needle is, the eye of the needle was a an entry point into the temples, and it was a very narrow em entry point. And so rich people who carried all of their stuff on their camels would not fit through, literally. It was a literal thing. <laughs> so... We need to, to understand that these, these are things that have been used to program us, and, and they don't need to be, right? I know a lot of people who make a lot of money, and they are all good people. So you just you need to restructure the, the thinking on this in order to have money in your life. And so this is for everybody, not just for you, because I've had this needs to be said, right? And so, you know, let's all re, redo this and say, look, the money needs to be held by the people who care about people. And let's, let's do it that way instead of just demonizing people who have money. How's that work for you? Well, you know, I had a whole bunch of things that I wanted to say throughout the middle of that. But as usual, you shored up most of my arguments throughout the process. And I feel like Papa Doc at the uh, end of 8 Mile and Eminem hands him the microphone and he's got nothing to say. So... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for waiting till I got to the end. <laughs> I, I, I do my best. You have taught me presence and active listening. So, you know, I really do <laughs> take that in to the best of my ability these days. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, we are eight minutes into the podcast. And we have not gotten to the topic yet, but the, it was a relevant side sidetrack. So, uh, Today we're talking about The Giving Tree and other narcissistic tales. So when I grew up, The Giving Tree was one of my favorite books. And it's not surprising because I, I grew up in a very codependent house. And The Giving Tree is the, the most codependent book I've ever seen in my entire life. And it is the most narcissistic book I have ever seen in my entire life. And I think the reason I liked it is because I got to be a narcissist without having any guilt when I was reading the book. But... <laughs> You know, because my mother was the narcissist, and so, you know, it was just, yeah, it's what it was. And so, when we look at The Giving Tree, you know, and if you haven't read The Giving Tree, good on you. But, <laughs> but The Giving not. Tree is basically... <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, my God. All right. So, The Giving Tree <laughs> is this book where this kid makes friend with, friends with this big tree. And in his childhood, he's climbing the tree and he's hanging out underneath the tree and reading books and, you know, he's, you know, whatever, whatever. And then he grows up and he's like getting married and the tree says, you should chop me down and use me to make your house. His friend that he's been with. So kill me. Right. <laughs> and, and so the kid chops him down and makes him into his house. And now the house doesn't talk to him anymore, right? Because the house is dead, right? But he comes back to the tree and, and, and the stump in his old age. And he, the stump says, you should sit on me. <laughs> and I'm like, and, you know, throughout his childhood, he was taking apples from the tree and all the things, right? So, 
you know, every time it was, you should take this, you should take that, you should take this. It was a taker book, right? And, and it was, the, you know, the giving, tr the giving tree was the, the tree <laughs> saying, take all that I am and leave me as nothing but a stump and then sit on me. That is what the book is. It is horrific. <laughs> and yet it is a lot of people's favorite book from their childhood, at least in my generation. I'm Gen X. So, but that was because our parents were absent and we were feral and, you know, <laughs> we, we needed somebody to take care of us. You know, we were latch. I was a latchkey kid when I was nine years old. So, you know, I had nobody at home from the time I was nine years old. So until my mom got home from work hours later. So the TV not, was my parent. Now that you explain that, I remember reading it. I remember that story. And it might have been my grandmother that read yeah. it to me. <laughs> so that, yeah. Yes, I, likely. I, it's definitely a boomer generation thing. <laughs> so, but, you know, I mean, that's, it, it, yeah. So. This is the thing, is that we are taught that narcissism is normal from a very young age. And we're taught that taking is normal from a very young age. If you've ever read the book, Call Me Ishmael, it is quite eye-opening around the idea that we as a culture, Western culture, I'm speaking of Western culture, is very much takers. We, we are not in harmony with the land. We are not in harmony with the world. We are not in balance. We are takers. And we take what the land has to give us to regardless of what it does to the land, which is something that I'm seeing down here in Panama with the, with the protests that have just shut down the mines in the last like six, eight months, because uh, they were strip mining the land. And it was destroying this beautiful country and, and its land. And, you know, the, yeah, they've got rich copper mines, but to get the, the, the ore out was just horrific to what it was doing to the land. So, you know, this is the, the idea, and of course it's, you know, U.S. companies. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyway, the, you, you know, and, the, and everybody's going, well, you know, oh, but they were paying for that. And again, this is where money gets squiggy, gets squidgy, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like, well, you know, if money is your God, if the love of money is your God, then you will do squidgy things. And that's because that's the outcome that you're looking for, right? So, you know, whereas if you're in balance and you're saying, well, yeah, it's 1.5% of the GDP, which it is down here, um, then, you know, okay, maybe we need to find a different way to make that 1.5% up, right? So those sorts of things are what we're talking about. Anyway, um, the, we are programmed and we have to recognize that there is programming happening within our culture, okay? I, I am a big media fiend. And so, you know, my, and that's because, <laughs> that's because I was raised by the television. And my, my default when I get, tired and get burned out is to just sit and watch. Well, I, I tell people I, I'm letting the TV watch me because half the time I don't know what, the, what I'm watching and what I've watched. I'm not really paying attention. But because I do consume so much vi uh, media, I see that across channels in the same week, you will see the same theme running across different channels as though you know, that it, it's very strange because I've, I've specifically looked and I'm like, are any of the writers the same? Are any of the, the studios the same? Are, you know, what's, what's, no, different writers, different studios, and, and yet same message going across. Now, you know, you could conspiracy theory, theory it and say, oh, they're getting together and programming us. Or you could say they're tapped into the gestalt of the universe and this is the next piece that we're being fed. And, you know, I mean, I don't really care which one it is, but you need to know that you're being programmed with it, right? So watch the themes. If you're, if you're consuming media, watch the themes because those themes are going to be the things that is being programmed into you and the people around you. And that's true in our children's books. It's true in our, the books that we read through school. You know, those are curated, right? And, you know, they're like, oh, well, these are classics. It's like, yeah, but any, any well-written book could be a classic. 
So why these books, right? And you know, a lot of this is us talking about, uh, you know, what, go what goes in is what comes out, right? So this is one of the reasons why I highly recommend that you curate your own input. Okay, so like right now, I'm not watching any current day shows. And I'm not watching them because they've gotten too violent, they've gotten too dystopian, they've gotten too miserable, they've gotten to the point where there isn't a single person on the show that I like. You know, it's really setting you up to be unhappy. The, the shows are designed to, to destroy your mental health right now. So I'm going back and watching stuff from the 80s and the 90s and, you know, those things because that was less dystopian <laughs> and it was slower paced and it's calmer and it's less violent and all of the things, right? So, you know, be careful what you're programming your brain with because this, this sort of thing really comes into play. And I've been sort of monologuing here for a while now, Josh. Do you want to stick two cents in? You know, I, I have the same, I came to the same conclusion when it comes to media. I, you know, I'm a social media, you know, I, it's one of my, the, the addictions that held on to in my life. And I've really tried to get away from it because like you said, you can see those themes, right? Like even, you know, well, however the algorithm works, not really sure, try to beat it, doesn't matter, comes back full swing. And I am a conspiracy theorist, you know, and I, I, <laughs> I am, I, you know, it, it started a, a long time ago. You know, one of the, one of the books I read in the early 2000s really kind of opened my mind. And to a degree, I believe that's what created my spiritual awakening a part of it just beginning to have these deeper level and existential questions about what life is and what the fuck is really going on outside of me and how that affects the way that I perceive the world but I'm uh, the same for me you know like I don't watch media I stopped watching the news in 2016 my life has only changed for the better you know like I I, I don't get I don't get involved in that so much and similarly I, I watch shows that are no longer being run you know I'm you know watching you know, shows that interest me, you know, ones that generally have some books associated with them because I, you know, have the background in, in reading excessively. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> one, of the, one of the questions I had, you know, like as you were talking, and I really do believe it ties into the beginning of this, where is the programming coming from and why is it that we're being programmed or what is it we're being programmed for? Because I really do think that ties into the beginning piece of coaching that we're giving me during during this <laughs> Well, so I want to be very clear. I don't buy into conspiracy theory. And, you know, I mention it that way, but I don't buy into it because most conspiracy theory ends up with you feeling like the victim. And that is a predominant energy that I do not want to live in. Okay, so we, we need to be really clear that conspiracy theory unto itself is a conspiracy theory thing, right? Because it's like, how, how victimized can I help people feel? Right. So it's it's a it's a rabbit hole. They 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 pull you in by making you feel important, like, you know, something that nobody else knows. And then they say, oh, and here it is. And here's how you can feel victimized by it. So you feel like you're important as a victim. And so it helps you to really identify with that victim energy. That's a that's another programming piece. And so, you know, the the point of the. Where does it come from? What's your question? And so let me just sit with that and see if my guides hand me anything. But the, the, no, they're not. So here, here's the thing. Okay. When we are talking about things like programming, cultural programming is everywhere, right? We are programmed from childhood to treat each other with kindness, to share, to, you know, not hit other people, not hurt other people. You know, the programming can be good, right? These are these are good programs that are being installed, but they're all programs, right? It's it's behavioral norms that are established by society, right? And as a culture, we all buy into these these norms and we perpetrate them upon our children, right? We perpetuate them, but perpetrate them. The same thing, right? So you know, we. When we step into our shamanic selves, we need to question all of our programming. And that includes the cultural norms and cultural programming, right? And so this is the piece that I'm, I, I, it doesn't matter where it comes from is kind of my point, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, is there some great Illuminati overlords, you know, or a, you know, oh God, what the hell's the name of it? There's a, 
there's a demiurge, right? Or is there a demiurge overlord that's, you can go look it up. It's just the idea that there's an energy that is, uh, you know, controlling us or whatever. You know, is there some evil forces in play? Or is it just our baser natures coming together collectively and, and bringing forth this stuff? You know, there are lots of, there are lots of, theories of why we're on the planet. Some people are, say that it's a video game, which is the one I, I ascribe to, right? It's a live action video game. And then other people are saying, oh, no, 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 a bunch of spirits came into the physical plane, got stuck here, and are now trying to get loose. That's the whole Course in Miracles perspective on it. Um, and, you know, we have to release and, and heal and learn in order to evolve to the point where we can get off the planet again, which I don't really ascribe to that because, you know, you die every hundred years at least, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> you're leaving the planet at that point. Why would you come back? I don't understand. Right. But, you know, whatever. You know, so there's there's a lot of different things to come into play here. But. There's a collective unconscious that creates our, our joint reality. And I personally believe all of these messages are coming from that collective unconscious. Now, is it coming through one or two people or through hundreds of thousands of people? I don't know. Do I care? It doesn't matter. It does not matter. This is the thing is that, you know, you, when you buy into the, oh, where is it coming from? Now you're buying into perpetuating it. But when you stick with, well, am I going to choose to be programmed by it? No. Then, you know, now it's no longer relevant to you, right? It's, it's simply a matter of stepping out of the programming and being able to look at it and say, oh, look, the programming for this week is this. Here, let me see what's going on in the world around me and let's see who has picked up on the programming. And I can start to see behind the curtain, right? And that's the... That's the reason why I point this stuff out, not for you to feel victimized and controlled and manipulated. And all of that's just a lot of drama that is still buying into it, right? The key is just to step back into observer mode and be like, hmm, all right, where is this going today, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is programmed in. And I'm rewatching Madam Secretary right now. And holy crap. That storyline throughout looks an awful lot like what happened in the last 10 years. Okay. It's terrifying. So, you know, and that's true for most of the political shows that you've seen is that the storylines play out in reality too. So where do they come from? I don't know. Were they programmed into the collective consciousness and then that came into form in reality? Maybe. Were they, you know, through the shows they were programmed in or was the, were the show writers picking up on what they could see in the future because that was coming and so therefore it was present in the zeitgeist of the, of the world, that energy that moves through the world? Um, I, either way it could be, but does it matter? No, it doesn't matter because if you choose to step out of it, you're no longer subject to it. As usual, you've given me quite a bit to to sit with once again. <laughs> I love that. I, I love this stuff. You know, I, I kind of took us a, a little far afield from the narcissistic tales, and I did have a couple questions. You know, like you know, yeah. you know, a lot a lot of the people we work with are empaths, correct? You know, a lot of people that are are, yeah. are stepping onto the path are empaths. Pretty much everybody. And Yep. Pretty much everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, because <laughs> we're pretty selective who we work with as well. Um, you know, that being said, you know, like I've always noticed over the last three years, especially, that it's always this empath narcissist continuum. Like every, you know, so many people that have come to work with us, it almost comes out of a, re a relationship with a narcissist. And I'm like, I, and I have questions in regards to that because I feel like that's also a victim statement. You know, like we were just talking about that to a little bit. I'm not saying that this isn't a, you know, a real thing, but I, I don't believe that there is that many narcissists in the world. Am I wrong? And what is your take on this? So, I was going to say, it's not always a narcissist. It is, um, you know, there are a lot that came from relationships with narcissists and gaslighting and, and the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. But it can also come from addiction, which is, has narcissistic properties, right? But is not narcissistic per se. You know, narcissists are, a, a, it's a clinical 
diagnosis, and it's a fairly rare clinical no diagnosis in terms of the numbers of people who get diagnosed with it. However, um, there are narcissistic symptoms ex ex extant, existing in the people who have come through in traumatic environments. And so if you grew up, so let's take my grandmother's generation, the, great, the greatest generation or the silent generation, right, depending on who, who you ask. They, they lived through World War I, World War, II, World War I, the Depression, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. I mean, their entire lives mm -hmm. were around war and you know, the losses of war and the rationing through war and the, the shortages and the not having enough and the whole shebang, right? That is freaking traumatizing. And they all came out, you know, if you listen, if you look at the, the generational description, they're pretty freaking narcissistic as a generation. And it's like, you know, they're, they're like me, 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 right? And, you know, they have no patience for anybody else and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But good reason. You know, they're like, fuck it. I've had enough. Right? <laughs> Done. Right? And so, you know, that generation came out that way because they were traumatized. And then, you know, the millennials now, they, they grew up in the, in the, um, in the shadow of 9-11. They've had active shooter drills. They're, you know, they were the first first group of kids to have active shooter drills. Now, m you know, my grandparents' generation were, and my parents' generation were hiding under their desks because of the Bay of Pigs and you know atomic bombs. Like hiding under your desk was going to do any good. My generation knew it wasn't going to do any good. My generation's just like, yeah, we'll be obliterated anytime. So you know, <laughs> any day now it could happen, and we were just living with that, right? But I, I gotta say that despite that sort of nihilistic approach to life that I grew up with because of it. Other people, you know, the, the millennials are dealing with the I could be shot in the face by one of my students, one of my fellow students. That, I think, is even more terrifying than the existential dread of, you know, we could all die because it's more personal, right? So, you know, we've all come up through a lot of trauma, you know. I mean, my parents didn't know where I was at 10 o'clock at night. That's why there was a thing on the TV that said, it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your kids are? And every night they would end that. <laughs> the 10 o'clock, the, the 10 o'clock news would end with, it's 10, or start with, it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your kids are? And so, you know, I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of ways in which we go into, so when you've been traumatized, you go into survival mode. When you go into survival mode, narcissistic tendencies show up because we become needy and we get empty and we get to the point where we have to take what we need in order to survive because we've given away too much right so we go into people pleasing which is giving away too much and then we go into you know i'm empty now so i got to take what i can what whatever i can get because i'm so empty i'm going to fall down if i don't get something now and that's where the narcissistic tendencies come into play and so you know we end up with these generations of people who have been traumatized raising other children and traumatizing them and then the world traumatizing people and then we end up with all of this cycle of narcissistic behavior despite the fact that they're not actually narcissists right so that's one of the things that my students talk to me about a lot is that as they wake up they go oh i'm starting to see how i i'm narcissistic am i bad and it's like no you're traumatized there's a difference and we're going to teach you how to not get empty so that you don't have these behaviors anymore that you have to feel bad about, right? So, you know, that's part of the process. Yeah, I know that was a huge part of my process. You know, when I, I remember our, my first initial call with you and I said, I don't know whether I'm an empath or a narcissist. And I don't know why I'm talking to you right now. And you, you assured me, you know, like, you know, you're, you're not a narcissist. You, you know, you wouldn't be here asking for this level of help, you know, if, if, if you were, you know, an, a narcissist. But, you know, what, what you just said, you know, like I grew up in a family of alcoholics and, you know, like my narcissism came from being on high alert all the time, right? Like I was always trying to manipulate people to keep a calm. But when I switched into addiction, you know, like when I when I developed my own addiction in my early teens, 
that just became an outright, you know, outright narcissistic tendencies because I was using it for my own personal gain. And it, the truth is, I was letting, you know, a substance rule my life, a substance or a drink rule my life in that time. And when I had come to you, I was like, I'm done with this shit. I can't, I can't do it anymore. But you know, it's, it, it's still something, you know, like that. It, it's tough, you know, when you're when you're an intelligent person, you go through the healing process. You, when you're going to the, that place, when you're getting to that place where you really want to stand in your power, you have to confront who it is you want to be in the world and confront, are these tendencies narcissistic or am I just standing firm with my boundaries and my power? And that's, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a web to untangle in itself. And it, it, it you know, it really takes some, takes some time. And, and, and like you said, you know, you've done so much, you know, analytical work and really diving back generation to generation to see how we got to this as a collective and where we're at today. So, you know, my, my work with you has really unlocked a lot of that. Yeah. So, so when we're looking at, you know, am I being narcissistic or am I just setting good boundaries? Because when you change the rules of your relationship with other people, they will say that what you're doing isn't okay. They will say you're being selfish. They will say that you're being evil, that you're, you know, what happened to you? You used to be such a nice person and now you're not. And what they're saying is I used to be able to manipulate you easier and now I'm frustrated that I can't. Right? So, you know, the, the key is to recognize that you're allowed to and, in fact, expected to take up space in your own life. You're supposed to be the hero of your own journey. And if everybody else is more important to you than you in your life, then you are not the hero of your own journey. You know, you need to be taking care of you and then feeding other people through your overflow, not from your emptiness. And so if you are feeling, you know, triggered that things are you know not working out the way that you want because somebody has crossed your boundary and then you get triggered and you get angry you have every right to push back on that it's your boundary if you set a boundary and somebody crosses it that n under no circumstances is any of that narcissism right the only time that could be narcissism is if your boundary was you will do everything i tell you to do and if you stray from it then you're a horrible person if that's your boundary that is narcissism okay <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm a fellow Scorpio, so, you know, I'm hard-headed to boot, yeah. you know, like, I, I'm just built hard-headed, uh, you know, I come, you know, like, woodpecker, I'm pretty sure is on my totem, so, you know, like, I totally, I totally resonate with everything you just, you just said there, it makes so much sense. That's so funny, I just did a podcast with somebody, and I'm actually going to cross-post it here as soon as he gets it edited, so it'll probably be a couple months, but, um, I just did one with him where I talked about that, uh, the idea that all, pretty much all of my students are hard-headed. <laughs> like, you know, That's why we like, make I'm it. I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. This is, you know, I'm going to tell my, my guides that they can go, go fuck off and I'm going to do what I want anyway. And then I'll come back and be like, okay, fine, whatever. Don't do what you said, but I don't freaking want to. And I'm, and I'm like, look, yeah, you can be as hard headed as you want. I just, all I can do is lead you. And if you decide you want to go in a different way, then you can go that way. And I will take care of you if you hurt yourself, but I will say, I told you so. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just like, because, you know, that's how we learn as hard headed people. Is we, we have to hear I told you so every so often and I say this out of love because I needed to hear it and I was I, that hard headed person and I, I needed I, I to hear that I can't tell you how many times in my life I followed a terrible path to its absolute fucking end right and like I, I, I can tell you like four times in my life I literally have nothing and I'm just staring at crossroads walking with nothing and I'm like fuck <laughs> you know because you know spirit gave me every option they're like you just you just don't have to do this and i'm like well that's stupid that's not what i want to do so i'm gonna i'm gonna do this anyway and then inevitably i'm sitting there like all right you know i'm mean, here it is a dark night i feel like robert johnson <laughs> you know like i'm just at the crossroads baby and you know nowhere nowhere to go and you know you that, that's day, you're all friendly <laughs> oh, we are. Oh, I, I, I love me some Hecate. Yeah, Hecate so, and... you know, I mean, but even so, you, you learn to 
you, you know, you're you're in the process of learning to to listen more easily to the people and the spirits around you because you are making shifts. I mean, we had a conversation about a business deal that you got into and <laughs> I was like, I think it's a bad idea and you did it anyway and it turned out to be a bad idea. And um but the next deal you brought me and I said, no, 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 you didn't do. And, you know, you're listening to your guides more and you're not telling them to go take a flying leap every time they tell you anything. You're actually considering it now. So it's a process, right? We, we learn to not listen to the people around us because they're assholes, you know, I mean, that's what we learned in our childhood is that the people around us were not supportive. They were not not anything. You know, if we were going to survive and, sur and thrive, have any chance of thriving, we had to not listen to the people who were around us. And we had to get to become these sort of, you know, reactionary, knee jerk, no people, because that was the only way we could maintain anything that was ours. And so, you know, it's not surprising that so many of my people are hardheaded is because that's how we survived our childhoods, right? So, you know, but then we have to learn how to understand and accept help from people who are looking out for our best interests and spirits who are looking out to, to make sure that we do well in life and that we thrive and that we get the love and the money and the support and the energy and the joy and the, you know, all the juicy goodness of life, right? And so it's just a process of learning how to take in that information and how to accept that stuff because, you know, and then giving ourselves credit for doing it, you know, like I'm doing with you right now. It's like, look at you, you have evolved and it's been very quick for you. You know, Josh is one of the fastest evolvers I've seen. Um, and, and it's mostly because he's just like, ah, whatever, fuck it, we'll do it. <laughs> There's just nothing like, that this bang. process can put me through that is worse than what I put myself through for 35 fucking years. It's just not, you know, I like know. I, I, I can dig into myself. It's not, you know, like it's not always pretty, but it's because I want, you know, like I have a vision of who I want to be in this world and how I can, you know, help humanity and also live my dream life. And they all tie together. And that's what brings me the excitement. And that's the excitement that I follow. But that that, that means that I'm, I have to do that deep level inner work to, to, to continue to unlock the limiting beliefs that I have or the, the challenging structures that are that need to come down for me to become who I want, wish to be. So, you know, it's 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 OK. I mean, it's maddening some days, but not as fucking maddening as living a life I hate. <laughs> Ding, 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 ding. Yes. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Yeah. So, okay. I think this is a great place to wrap up this episode. So we're, we're going to, we're going to leave it with that and say, you know, this is, th that's the wrap up, right? It's like, it's, it's so much easier to do this than, than everything else before. Right. So with that, I'm just going to say, remember what you focus on expands what you intend you create. So choose wisely young Jedis. We will see you next week. So that's it for today's episode of Spirit Guides Podcast. Head on over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen and subscribe to the show. Every week, one lucky listener who subscribes and posts a review on iTunes will be entered into a drawing for a $10,000 value grand prize and a private reading with Kelly Sparta herself. Be sure to head on over to spiritguidespodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Kelly's gift and join us on the next episode. Oh, I'm